and a life when there's a total surrounding of darkness, God still pierces through them. Um, real quick, I just want to open up in a word of prayer. Father God, we come to you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, Lord. I ask that you give us ears to hear, soft hearts to receive your word, Father God. I ask, Lord, that every single word that passes through my lips be um, in accordance with the Holy Spirit, Father God. I ask, Father God, that you make the, our hearts um, soft soil for what it is you're trying to plant, Lord God. And may you have all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, today we're talking about sanctity of life. We just heard the testimony of people who are literally giving away time and effort and energies for the saving of millions of unborn babies being murdered day in and day out. And I've been watching a lot of the um, debates going back and forth between the college candidate. It seems like the topic of pro-life, pro-choice is getting thrown around left and right. Sometimes I get a little aggravated because I feel like the thoughts of sanctity of life are getting played more as a power card so that way one side can win over the other versus really treating it as the issue as God intended it to be. And it seems to be such a controversial topic. It's not just controversial in colleges, but I remember being in middle school and when I said, you know, I'm pro-life, immediately half the class started yelling at me and screaming at me in the middle of a class just because we were talking about the issue with the teacher. And the teacher cited, of course, against me, which is fine. I have grace and I understand. And literally I got sent to the principal's office just because he said I cited it right because I stated my opinion. And so think about it. A topic of sanctity of life, it causes so much of a stir. It's obviously something we need to address as a Christian body and as born-again believers so that way we can understand what God's view of it is in correlation to what the culture is deeming it to be. So we're going to go through some scriptures today. Some of them may be very familiar. And what I ask is that you don't look at them as if I've been here, I've done that, I've read this before, I've got it understood. But ask the Holy Spirit to really speak to you and ask, Lord, what is it you really want me to see? And Lord, I don't want it just be information in my head to discern and to dissect. But Lord God, I want your life to, to, to truly birth in my heart. So with that, I was thinking, if we're going to understand the sanctity of life, let's go to the origin of it. Let's go to when God created it and what was his first design for it. So, if you have your Bibles, please turn to Genesis 1. We're going to go to verse 26 and 27. And up to this point, we see God is creating everything. He's created light. He's created the universe. He's created the galaxies. He created the Milky Way. And then he created Earth. And then he created the oceans and the rivers and the streams. And then he created land. And then he spoke to the waters and he said, let there be fish and let there be swimming creatures of all kinds. And then he spoke to the land and he said, let there be beasts of the earth. Let there be elephants and cows and lions. And as, my, as Haley goes on when we read the story, she's like, make sure there's a hippo. She loves hippos. So Haley wants to make sure that I mention the hippo. But then comes time for mankind. God doesn't speak to the earth. God doesn't speak to the waters. This is what he says in his word. Verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth. And over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. There's a lot in that verse. We just go to the very beginning. Let us make man in our own image. That word us, a lot of scholars, and I believe, gives witness to the Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We were made by Father, Son, Holy Spirit. God didn't say, I'm just going to make you like everything else. He's like, no. What makes you special is going to come from me. And hear me out. I'm not saying we're a bunch of little gods and we're a bunch of, of little Christ. But what I'm saying is what makes us special is God didn't just speak only to the earth. But he said, I want, some, I want something special with man. When we are made as his own image, we're not just a body, but we are also a spirit. We have a spirit man. Because God created us to have relationship with him. And he created man and woman both in his own image. And then we go to Genesis 2, verse 7. And this is what it says. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. If you have a King James Version, it says man became a living soul. Think about that. Before this, man was just an inanimate object, empty in the shape 
made out of sand, dirt, mud. It's kind of like when you build sand castles out on the beach. You, you make an image, but there's no life there. They're, they can't think. They can't move. They can't say yes or no, sir. It wasn't until God breathed into the nostrils of this form and it became a living soul, a living eternal soul. Every, look to the person to your left. Look to the person to your right. That person has an eternal soul that either is going to be eternally with God or eternally separated from God. Think about that. Now think about your neighbor. Think about the people at work. Think about the people going in and out of doctor's offices, left and right. They have an eternal soul that will either be eternally with God or separated from God. Are we just a bunch of flesh? meat, bone, and protoplasm at that point? Or did God intend for something more in his original design? Psalms 95.6 says, Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. God created us. We see in Genesis, Adam and Eve were called to have authority over everything God created. But in the cool of the day, God what? He came down and he walked with them. And he had a relationship with them. And he talked with them. <coughs> Think about that. Our original design was to serve God, preserve what he created, and to be in relationship with him. You know, it's like sometimes I feel like I just need to get a little more money so I can be a little more stable and take care of my friends. And I got to be a good friend and a good dad and a good husband. And when I reach all these things, I've completed everything that I'm created to do. And no! Our main purpose was to be in relationship to God. We were created for Him. Culture today says if there is a God, we created Him for us, which is a total, complete lie. Opposite of what the scripture says. And then we realize man has a spirit so it can connect with God. Man has an eternal soul, which animals do not have. The fish of the sea do not have. Plants do not have. If Sorry, pantheism doesn't exist. If you don't know pantheism, that's basically what you think God is the creator. And if we understand what God truly had in the beginning for our design, would I, would we be so quick to just turn our heads when we hear about millions of unborn <coughs> babies being killed left and right? Will we think twice before we just treat people who may be handicapped in one way or another as lesser than? You know, that Genesis 1 is the scripture that when my grandmother was unable to live on her own anymore, my mom brought her into the house, gave her her mas the master bedroom that my parents slept in, and that's where she stayed until the end of her days because she saw Genesis 1. And she realized that she still had worth and value because it's not her body that gives her worth, it's the eternal soul and the spirit that was reborn. We as Christians, above all else, should have this understanding. For those of you who don't know, I'm going to give my testimony again. I'm adopted. My brother and I both are adopted. How many here is adopted? I'm just curious. You know, one, two, three, four. Wow, we have a couple more than I thought. Go adopt these. <laughs> <laughs> so me and my brother are both adopted. And um, if you heard the story, sorry, I'm going to tell it again. Um, around 1981, 82... Both my parents, they weren't able to have children, and they like, man, we really want a child. God really burned it into their hearts. We really want a child. And so they knew somebody in the church who was getting into um, being an adoption agent. He was a lawyer. And so they're like, we really want a child. Can you help us? He's like, absolutely. And I know a little more information than most people do. My adoption and my brother's adoption was a closed adoption. I know a little more information than most closed adoptions do. And that's that. That's where I'll leave it at. <laughs> um... But at the same time, they were looking for a child. They'd signed the papers. They'd gone through all the background check. This man who was doing the adoption was in contact with a very young girl who became pregnant. She was not married. And her boyfriend was significantly older than her. And from what I do know, he literally put out the question. He's like, you either get rid of the baby, which is me, or I'm gone. And not a day goes by when I think about that, I don't praise God for the fact that that woman, I don't know where she was with the Lord, but she had enough fear of God and enough understanding that the baby inside of her was important and had value. She said no. And so she went to this man and she's like, can you please find a good home for my baby? 
And this is how awesome God is. In the midst of all of it, my parents found out two or three weeks earlier, they got a phone call from the adoption agent. And they said, this girl just called me out of the blue and said, I want to make sure that this baby goes to a Christian family who are spirit-filled, who believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and will train this kid in the way that God has called it to be. And he said, the first people I thought was to call you. So obviously this woman had enough understanding of God to be praying over who's going to take care of this child, who's going to watch over him, who's going to nourish him, who's going to see the worth and value that God has for this soul. And even further it, when, um, when, uh, to just show how God was moving and everything, my parents signed um, between when they signed the, the, the um, running list to, to adopt a baby to when I was born, it was nine months. Which means around the time that I was conceived was when my parents had solidified in their mind that they were going to have a child. We go two and a half years later, my brother. My parents wanted another baby. They go to the same adoption agent. They're looking for their brother. They're looking for my brother. And so the adoption agent um, who, who adopted Blake, we found out through a uh, backwards story that the woman who conceived or, or um, had my brother, he was, she was 16, and she was so scared to death that someone's going to find out that she's pregnant that she didn't, she barely ate. No one knew that she was pregnant. She didn't show until third trimester. She had starved herself so much out of fear of what people would do when they find out that she's pregnant. One way or another, her mother found out. And before we know it, she was dragged to the abortion clinic. And all I know is that she was crying hysterically. She didn't even want to go. And the mother goes to the doctor and says, get rid of the baby. The doctor said, praise the Lord. There's no way I'm doing an abortion on a baby that's in its third trimester. Sorry. One way or another, they got in contact with the adoption agent. And they said, I need to find a home for this baby. And again, there's some other little things where God just, just sovereignly moved in our lives. And a week before my brother was born, the parents he was supposed to go to, they had a baby. They were pregnant. And so he's like, you're next. And it was a sovereign move of God. If it, the more we talk about me and my brother, how our lives played out, you know that that's exactly how the Lord yeah. would move. And this is why I share my testimony. Because think about this. Me and my brother were both were born, conceived, in situations that weren't the best. In situations where mistakes were made. But God didn't see me and my brother as a mistake. And my, my adopted parents, who me and my brother call our parents, they looked at us as valuable. They looked at us as worth. And they said that we were a gift to God. You know, we call them our, our real mom and dad. We forget that we're adopted all the time. You know, when I'm preparing this message, I totally forget that I'm adopted every single day. People ask, well, don't you want to go see your birth parents or something? You know, no ill will towards them, but no. I have no emptiness in my heart because my parents always fed me with what God said about me is that you are a gift from God you have worth and you have value and this is what God has to say and this is what God has to say and it just floors my mind every time I think about that and so I pose this question have you thought what does God say about you you know and as, as we're talking about this obviously the topic of, of adoption and, and um, worth and value is going to go back and forth and I'm just going to put it out there if you as a man or a woman has ever taken part or had play in an abortion, there is forgiveness and redemption for you through Jesus Christ. You repent and believe and God wipes away that sin with the blood of Jesus Christ. And you can come in because he has forgiven the worst of the worst. And I tell you, one sin is as bad as all of them. So please, if you're feeling condemnation or conviction or whatever, understand that there is love and there is acceptance in the Son of Jesus Christ. And if you really, truly want to understand that, there will be people here afterwards to pray with you and to go through that. But I say this because despite the world trying to kill me and my brother, God brought about salvation for us and redemption for us because He loves us and finds worth and value because we were created in His image. You are created in God's image. Go ahead and turn to Psalms 139. I don't know how familiar you are with Psalms 139. Um, I tend to think it's very familiar. Uh, this psalm has helped me when I have felt worthless, when I felt like God is far away, when I am dealing with issues of feeling um, rejected and, and, and going through that dark place. This psalm has brought so much life and so much of God's perspective to me. And basically the emphasis of it, fearfully and wonderfully we are made. In case you don't know it, God formed everyone. 
We see it in Colossians 1.16, John 1.3, 1 uh, Corinthians 8.6, Hebrews 1.2, Psalms 95.6. Pretty much everything was made by Christ, through Christ, for Christ. And then we get into Psalms 139. And I'm going to read this out loud. And uh, you either read along or close your eyes and just let, let the Holy Spirit speak. And it, for you were formed, for you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth, which um, gives a picture of the womb. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were written all the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not a single one of them. Other translations will say members, but the understanding is God knew everything about you before there was even a conception. Do you realize how awesome that is? This entire song is talking about how all-powerful, all-knowing, all all seeing God is. And then it goes into this God being so amazing. This is what I think about you. I didn't just arbitrarily set into motion things and then left you on your own. I, God, had a part to play in each and every single one of you, a conception about your spirit, personality. Let's break this down real quick. Verse 13. For you were formed, for you formed my inward parts, and you wove me in my mother's womb. That that term inward parts, when you really look at it in the original text, it literally means um, vital organs. Think about that. When you were in the womb, God knew everything that you needed that was vital to who you are. We're not, don't even just think about the physical. Think about what you need as a person. He knew how you needed love. He knew that you needed salvation. He knew every single little mark across your life that was going to affect who you are. And God knew how to build you up. God knew how to steer you towards God. God loves you and knows you more than anybody else. How many of you are married here today? Have a spouse with you. Okay, look to the spouse right next to you. And if, if you're single, sorry. But look at your spouse and realize as much as that person loves you and has been through thick and thin, they don't even know a fraction of a decimal of a point of what God knows about you and loves about you and created about you. We go to verse 15. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought, or skillfully made, I, I was in the womb. I, this, this is where I get corny. Every time I read that scripture, I always think, God's got skills. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's corny, I know, but God's got skills. Think about it. If God was to build a paint, make a painting, Van Gogh, Leonardo, all of them, they look like finger paints from a two-year-old in comparison. If God was to make a building, it would last forever, not, sink, not tarnished at all. The pyramids would look nothing more than a sandcastle my daughter made, and then was swept away by the wave in a few hours. What does that mean about you? If you were skillfully made, think about that. My eyes were skillfully made. We would have vision. Now, I wear glasses. That's because I'm in a fallen world because of sin. That was our choice. That was our doing, mankind's doing. That's not God's doing. Think about that. If you're an extrovert, if you like to talk a lot, God skillfully made me to talk a lot. If you're quiet, God skillfully made you to listen. Think about that. I'm skillfully made to be five foot six and a half. All you guys need to get with the artists in here, okay? I'm sorry, but that's just how it is. Everyone say this with me one more time. I, I am skillfully and wonderfully made by the Creator. Do you believe that? I don't know if you do. Let me, let me just go down to one more scripture and then we'll see. Verse 14. I will give thanks to you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works and my soul knows it well. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. That word fearfully means set apart and awesome. We are awesomely made by an awesome creator and an awesome God. We should give thanks every day for how we are made. But if you're like me, I think I spend far too many times looking in that mirror before the day starts. I think, man, we're ugly. Man, you screw up so many times. People don't even know what you, goes through your mind throughout the day. How many of you guys lay in the bed 
Everyone's asleep, house is quiet. You don't sleep for two hours because you think about all the things you wish you were and you weren't. And you ask the questions, why was I born? Would it even matter if I were to just disappear? Would it change anything in anybody's lives? Those are lies from the pit of hell because God created you to know him with value. And when we take the term sanctity of life and just throw it into a political arena, when we take the sanctity of life and we just ignore it, then what we are doing is we are ignoring an artisan, a creator, a God that skillfully and wonderfully made you. Close your eyes just real quick. Close your eyes. What's the running thought that you regret about yourself? That you wrestle with every time when you're looking in the mirror? The one thing that always says, well, God can't use me. Whatever that is. When you get it, now ask the Lord, but what can you do? What can your skillful hands do about that, Father God? Your almighty, all-powerful hand that moved hell and high water to be able to come to you and save you. Whatever you propose before the Lord and says, I can't be used because of this, I say Psalms 139 and the rest of the scripture says he can and he will. Open your eyes. We need to give thanks. You know, sometimes I just wake up in the morning and say, praise God. Thank you, Lord God, that you just created me to be able to walk this life and to be able to serve you and, and to live for you. And thank you for my children, Lord God. I praise you, Father God, that you are going to do everything that you can to reveal who you are, Father God, to them. And Lord, I ask, Lord God, that you, you just help me to show them how much worth that they have in you. I praise you for that opportunity. God being all-powerful, all-knowing, omnipresent, holy, eternal, just, righteous, loving, and good. He is totally, eternally self-sufficient. That God decided to be intimately involved in our creation. He is not uninvolved. If you feel like God is far away, I'm here to tell you that that is a lie. That it's either been the enemy, the world, or sin that has kept that 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 separation before you. But the Lord has brought Jesus Christ so that you may be with God. Amen. Because he is intimately involved. This whole book, the scriptures revealed by the Holy Spirit is nothing but God interacting with man and his creation to bring them back to him. How dare we say God is not involved? We see all in the Old Testament, he revealed himself time and time again. He brought redemption time and time again for no other reason than he wanted to because he cares about us and he loves us. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, God himself, Emmanuel, because he's like, you sinned, you're separated from me, but I will take it upon myself to give you grace, unmerited favor, because I love you and I will come down into the world and I will live in myself and I will live the life you couldn't live. And I will reveal the Father. And I will die on that cross. And I will take on every single sin, every single guilt and shame. Everything that you have ever done that has been a direct affront to God's character. Christ took it upon himself. The opposite of what he wants to be. He says, I'll pay the price. And he died. And he rose again in power and victory and authority. So that we may be with him. So that the original design that God stated in Genesis can be fulfilled. That's how much God is involved in your life. And then some. Though we sin, reject God, reject his ways, being all-powerful and all-knowing, omnipresent, holy, just, loving, and good, and eternally self-sufficient, God became intimately involved in our salvation by putting on flesh, which is Jesus, and became our Savior. Why? Did anything you do bring a cause for that? No. He did it because he desired it. And it wasn't out of any longing or hole in his heart that needed to be filled by the creation of us because he is self-sufficient, but it's because he just wanted to. He loves us. He finds worth and value in his creation and wants reconciliation. It is grace. And if there's anything today that you feel like, I can't get past this. There's many times where I'm like, I'm born again. I've come to the Lord. I, I repented. I believe. 
but I can't get over this. I've ran into so many men and women who have been involved in abortions. When I talk about my testimony and I find out that they've had an abortion, they're like, well, I know God forgives me. And I, I know I've given my life to him and I know it's covered by the blood. But they have for years upon years, 10, 20 years, have lived in a constant grieving stage. And they have been carrying upon their back murder. And they've been carrying on their back the sin that even though they know Christ is forgiven, they have not walked it out. There is no healing going on in the soul and in the spirit. What sin have you been carrying on your back? If you are born again, what is it that you've been carrying on your back? And you've been agreeing with the enemy instead of understanding and agreeing that Jesus Christ says, I call, I make you a new creation in me. You are a new creation. No longer do I see Sean Canada and his mistakes. But I see Jesus Christ. I see the Holy Spirit that is living in him. Jesus, God sees the Holy Spirit that is living in you. <coughs> If that's you, if, if there's any area in your life today where you're like, oh, I've never gotten over this. I still view myself in this light. I don't do it anymore. I've come to the cross. And I know it's forgiven. But I'm still living through it emotionally as if it was day one. We'll pray for you. Because God wants to bring healing into that area. The grand architect and artisan of the cosmos created with such artistry, intent, and grace. Why would the world and why would people agree with the enemy and just kill without any thought to its purpose, what God created? The enemy kills, but Jesus brings life. The goal of the enemy. Who's the enemy? Satan. The devil. The goal of the enemy is to steal, kill, and destroy anything that had anything to do with God. Even if you're, if you're like, well, I don't believe in God, I'm a, you know, we'll just say I'm an atheist, or, or I believe in, in another God, or whatever. Even though you may be working out the way the enemy wants it to happen, he still hates you, and he's going to kill you just because of the fact that you're made in his image, regardless if you're reborn or regenerated. I've been around people, I actually had two or three friends that were Satanists, and, and we had a lot of lively debates, and a lot of lively talks. Um, but they, two of them actually said, well, I know Satan's going to take care of me. Came straight from the horse's mouth. I just told him, well, how many people have you seen that are older than you who have been following the way you've been following? He's like, oh, tons. I'm like, how did they end up? Most of them did not have pretty endings. It was actually nasty and disgusting the way that they died. I'm like, so after the enemy uses you and abuses you, he spits you out and kills you just like everybody else he wants to kill and destroy. The enemy is a liar, a killer, a murderer, and a deceiver. We see in John 8, 44 and Mark 4, 15. Satan is a murderer, a liar, and a thief. This comes out of the mouth of Jesus Christ himself. We see in John 10, 10. Actually, can we put John 10, 10? Oh, it's up there. Yay. <laughs> the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. This is Jesus. I came that they may have life and life abundantly. Now, this text, I know it comes from the section of Scripture where Jesus is talking about coming to him, and it's the only way to the sheepfold, versus the people who try to proclaim that they know God and steal the sheep away. But I pull this Scripture up because it's a very light and dark, very contrasting show, the enemy and Jesus Christ. The enemy is always about to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus Christ is always about to bring life. Whenever you see death and destruction and sin running rampant, you know who's in charge. The enemy. Who's the only one that can bring life? Jesus Christ. Write these scriptures down if, you, if you're into, I don't know, pray you're into studying and looking these up. But Jesus is life and the bringer of life. John 1, 4, which is an entire chapter that describes who Jesus Christ is. In him was life and the light of the world. And he gave it to men. John 10, 10. He brings life and life abundantly. John 14, 6, which we all Hold as a staple. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. This wasn't philosophical jargon. This is reality. If you want to be spiritually alive, it's through Jesus Christ. If you want to be alive to God, it's through Jesus Christ. If you want to know what it is to actually preserve and understand sanctity of life, it's only through God who created it and through Jesus Christ. The enemy kills to try and stop the kingdom of God 
and to destroy anything that bears or reflects God's glory. I've asked many times, okay, God, why is there so many abortions? Why are there so many genocides? Why, why in the history of mankind we found it okay to dub these people less than and then do away with them or stick them in a closet? And as I read the scriptures, time and time again, it's because the enemy hates the kingdom of God and hates anything that resembles anything that has to do with God. So as I was reading the scripture, Amos 1.13 popped out to me as an awesome illustration from the scriptures that bears understanding of what God really thinks about abortion, but also what God really thinks and what, what the enemy is trying to accomplish. And it says, Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of the sons of Ammon, which is a nation, and four I will not revoke its punishment, because they ripped open the pregnant woman of Gilead in order to enlarge their borders. Think about that. This nation of Ammon, they worship Molech. How many of you guys know what Molech is? Molech was their god, their false, demonic, idolatrous god. And they would literally sacrifice all the time the firstborn children. And men and women, the fathers and mothers, were forced, regardless if they felt it or not, to fake a smile as tears were running down their face for the sacrifice of their, their children, for their sins. These children were sacrificed so that the sins of the mother and father would be forgiven. And then this nation, who that was their God, they decide, you know what? God's people, the Israelites, we want their kingdom. So we're going to kill the pregnant mothers. I'm sorry to be graphic, but it's the truth. Every time you see the enemy try to kill us, because he wants control. He wants to destroy the kingdom of God. We see it with Moses. Israelites are in Egypt. They're slaves. And Pharaoh, under the influence of the enemy. And look at the Israelites, there's so many of them. They're going to overtake us one day. I'm not going to have it. Kill every single male child two years and under. And out of that arose Moses, the deliverer of the people who brought them into the promised land. Moses was a Christ-like figure. He was a shadow, a foretelling of who Jesus Christ was. The enemy wanted to destroy the moving of God, and God still persevered. We see the same thing with Jesus Christ. When he was born, King Herod knew that there's prophecies about the king of the Jews. He's like, I don't want that. And of course, Satan knows that's the Messiah. I don't want that either. So they both agree with each other. And again, the killing of male child is two years and under. And God, again, sovereignly let there be salvation. How many Moseses could there have been that all the children have been killed over the years? How many wonderful testimonies to God's glory could there have been if we hadn't just shoved our elderly into a home and then forget about them? How many healings and supernatural events are changing of our hearts because we have someone who is mentally handicapped we have dubbed as unworthy or just a nuisance? I've had friends who have been mentally handicapped and I've learned more about God from them than I have from some of the sermons I've sat on. The problem with this mindset of not understanding the sanctity of life and what God says about life, about abortion and genocide, is this is, this is what it all represents, a grievous lie and judgment that says, you are worthless. You have no value to God. And that to me is just a slap in the face of Jesus Christ upon the cross and resurrected. That literally says what God did in Genesis 1. It's a lie. And we know that's not true. God gives value, worth, and life in the Son. God has knowledge of you. And we see it time and time again in Scripture. We see it with King David in Psalms 139. And we see it time and time again in the Psalms. We see with John the Baptist. His father was in the Holy of Holies. And God said, I'm going to give you a son. And this is what he's going to do. And of course, he didn't believe, so he was... You so finally it happened. We see with Paul, he was in his mother's womb, God formed and knew what he was called to do. We see with Moses, we see with Esther, for such a time as this. Jeremiah 1 5. Before you conceive, I appointed you a prophet to the nations. What does God say about you? Despite what the enemy is trying to say. 
We were created to do the will and the purposes of God. We were created to worship Him, to serve Him, and be in a covenant. We were created for God. And if the neighbor to your left, the neighbor to your right, your children, your parents, your grandparents, they were created for God. Should we not be good stewards of those eternal souls and the people around us? We're out of worship team, come on. But think about that. Maybe some of you are asking yourself, or you've had the questions like, what did God put me on this earth to do? What am I really here for? I'm just going to have some of the elders come up. Stephen, Fran. And if you really